Welcome to Hill War Stories. In this episode, I'll be discussing the Evergreen Gang. Evergreen 13 is a Mexican-American gang located in Boyle Heights. Boyle Heights is a predominantly Latino neighborhood just east of downtown Los Angeles before World War II and even into the 60s, redlining afflicted much of Los Angeles. Many groups are denied an opportunity to buy homes or start businesses, but the more welcoming Boyle Heights became largely Jewish, Japanese, and Mexican. The community has never been homogenous. It's a neighborhood divided by freeways and a place where immigrants who were now welcome in other parts of Los Angeles could find home. In the later half of the 20th century, as the region grew and policies changed, Boyle Heights continued to change as well. And by the mid 1980s, Boyle Heights was a community in anguish. 35 years of intense freeway construction eliminated 2,900 homes, displacing 10,000 people and left noise and air pollution in its wake. Schools were crowded, housing was scarce, Unemployment was higher than in most other areas in the city. There was a sense that the community had little to no political power and is largely ignored by the city. And a different gang claims every inch of the neighborhood. The origin of Evergreen 13 dates back to at least the early 1940s, was started as a neighborhood football team, transformed into a gang. And by the late 1940s, the Evergreen gang had about 75 members whose ages ranged from early teens to mid twenties. They operated in an area bounded by First Street, My Street, 4th Street and Indiana Street. Generally, they frequent the Evergreen Recreational Center at 2834 East 4th Street and various cafes and bars in that vicinity. By the late 1940s, the Evergreens were some of the most active juvenile gangsters in Los Angeles County and have been involved in several fights with the White Fence Gang, who has always been considered their mortal enemy. Guns have been used in these battles and members of Evergreen are reported to handle large quantities of narcotics. In 1949, a 14-year-old boy named Joe Vasquez from the White Fence Gang was shot in the leg by assailants he said he never saw. The shooting occurred near his home on the 500 block of South Bernal Street. It was labeled as an evergreen shooting. Joe recovered from the 22 caliber bullet wound more than three years later on November 1st, 1952. That same Joe Vasquez was attending a party at the home of a friend when a group of evergreens came to crash the affair in a quarrel that followed. Joe Vasquez was shot again by the Evergreens, but this time Joe died at the age of 18. Five suspects were arrested, all Evergreen members. Two of them were only 16 years old. Fast forward to the early 1990s. By this point, Evergreen was considered even deadly of Ario. Although not the biggest in numbers, they had strong leadership under their shot caller Scooby and thus were able to hold their ground against much larger Varios, such as White Fence. Steve Blunt Jr. was born on December 19th, 1974 half black American, half Mexican American. His father, OG Steve, was entrenched in the gang life by the time Scooby was born. His father was one of the original members of the EG Dukes. Growing up for Scooby was hard, practically raised on the streets, being passed between relatives, all while his father and mother were feeding their heroin addictions. While his parents were absent, young Scooby decided to follow his father's footsteps and join the Evergreen Gang. He quickly gained the reputation as a rider, making an immediate impact and shifting his barrio in the right direction. His calculated decision making and natural born leadership made him a shot caller for Evergreen 13. He assisted in making his barrio profitable by taking full advantage of the flourishing drug trade. More funds supplied Evergreen with heavy artillery to be fully equipped to take on their much larger enemies because the enemies were coming. During the mid 90s, Evergreen Park and Bull Heights were hot as ever. High school students were in fear of getting caught in gang crossfire as they passed Evergreen Park on their walk to school. Residents surrounding Evergreen Park complained of everyday shooting. Drive-by attempts set on adults and children running and ducking for cover. The conflict grew so extreme that the city set up a new safe school program for Roosevelt High students after a 16-year-old student was struck by a bullet that went through her backpack. The program targeted a quarter square mile around the school, including and emphasizing the park for about 10 hours a day when students are in school or traveling to and from their homes. But as soon as the night falls, the shootouts commenced. Despite numerous attempts to weaken them, Evergreen stood tall under Scooby. He was respected by many, but also made a few enemies along the way, one of them being Cam. The Cam gang is also located in Bull Heights. Cam, which stands for crazy ass Mexicans, or killing after midnight, started off as a tagging crew, but transformed into a deadly barrio. By 1994, they were blessed with the 13. And by the late 90s, they were a force that was undeniable filled with young hitters on one cold December night. The camp gang conspired with two females to assassinate Scooby. The evil plot was successful. The two Heinans were able to lure Scooby 
into a spot where he was ambushed and shot down by a member from Cam. Scooby was dead and just 23 years old. He left behind two sons and the mother of his child. His funeral was large as the whole hood came out to pay their respects. Scooby's name had respect through multiple varios across Boyle Heights. When he died, their vario took a major hit. His father, OG Steve, had just started to get clean at the time his son was killed. Scooby's passing took a big toll on OG Steve. And just a few years after that, his wife passed from liver disease. OG Steve currently lives in comfortable retirement in a high rise building in downtown Los Angeles with panoramic views of the city. He still crosses the bridge to his old neighborhood several times a week to check in on his family. He has seven grandchildren and one great grandchild. Scooby's killer was shot in 2002 and was paralyzed from the waist down and is reportedly in the streets addicted to heroin. After Scooby's death, Evergreen continued to war with surrounding barrios, in particular, the White Fence Gang. On February 13th, 1999, Raymond Adilo, also known as tribute from the White Fence Gang, died from a gunshot wound to his torso, and his body was found next to the entry of an alleyway, which ran from 7th Street to Atlantic. Chewie and Ruben from Evergreen were suspected of carrying out the killing just a day after the funeral. On February 21st, at around 3 p.m., a man walked up from the rear to about five feet of a van, which had just stopped behind two cars on Concord near 4th Street. The man then began shooting. Jaime, the van driver, and Renee, the front passenger, were both shot. Eduardo, who was seated in the van's last row, was not injured. Jaime sustained three gunshot wounds and died from a gunshot wound to his chest. Renee, his brother, died from multiple gunshot wounds. At first, Eduardo refused to cooperate because he was concerned about being labeled a snitch. Eduardo then said a gang member who testified against a rival gang member was not considered a snitch. Eventually, he told police what he saw and that the shooter was bald with a mustache standing around 5'11". Patricia Cerda, the victim's older sister, testified that Eduardo told her on various occasions that Trippy's brother killed the victims because he was upset that Trippy had been killed the previous week. Oscar Perez, who resided on Concord near 4th Street, was 100% certain in his identification of Saul at trial. As the shooter, Oscar was driving near 4th and Concord when someone approached and claimed, White Fence, and began shooting. As Oscar turned right at the intersection, his car was struck by three bullets. He was afraid something similar would happen to his family and planned to move his family after trial. Saul was a White Fence gang shot caller, an elevated member who had proven himself by committing drive-by shootings and performing other gang-related missions. A gang member who was not incarcerated would personally seek revenge against the direct perpetrator of the rival gang or his perceived family members. Under these circumstances, it would thus be Saul's highest priority to avenge his brother's death. The murders took place within 24 hours of Saul's younger brother's funeral. The murders, which occurred in a disputed area near the boundary of both gang's territories, were committed about 100 yards from the hole, which was an area underneath the bridge, a short distance from 4th and Concord. The term the hole also referred to a clique of about 50 to 100 White Fence gang members who conjugated there. Saul Adilo from the White Fence gang was convicted on two counts of premeditated murder. He was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Evergreen and White Fence's prolonged war transitioned into the 2000s shortly after midnight on October 3rd, 2004. Anna was driving her minivan accompanied by Javier from Evergreen and her three children in need of gas. She entered a gas station at White Fence territory. She knew that members of the White Fence gang often hung out at that gas station and asked Javier for protection. As she pumped gas into the minivan, Javier approached Mike, who was also pumping gas into his truck. Javier cursed and told Mike, say fuck White Fence, say it like you mean it. After Mike complied, Javier searched Mike's pockets at gunpoint. Mike then said, not right now, I'm with my family. Javier answered, nigga, I don't give a fuck who you with. After Edith, who was an eyewitness, asked Javier to leave Mike alone. Javier hit Mike's head with the gun and responded, I could smoke him right now. Without removing the nozzle from his truck, Mike walked around the front of the truck to his passenger side as he was followed by Javier. Edith then heard a gunshot and Mike yelled out, I'm hit, I've been shot, as he jumped into his truck and held his stomach as Edith accelerated out of the gas station. A second gunshot shattered the window of her truck immediately after the shooting. Javier jumped into Anna's minivan and she dropped him off at home. Mike, who also testified at trial, stated that he belonged to the White Fence gang and identified Javier as the shooter. 
Javier Quinones from Evergreen was convicted on one count of attempted premeditated murder. He was sentenced to 15 years to life plus 25 years. Let's fast forward into the 2020s. Although they were never a large gang, their current numbers aren't half the size as they were in previous years. Despite this, they are still able to attract young recruits that are ready to put in work for the gang. On December 7th, 2021, at around 3.30 p.m., Jeremy, also known as Rugrat from Evergreen, was hanging out in front of Evergreen Park. It was broad day when a few teen rival gang members approached. An argument ensued, and one of those teens put out a gun and began shooting, hitting Jeremy multiple times. When officers arrived, they found Jeremy lying in the parking lot, conscious but barely breathing. Jeremy was pronounced dead at the scene. He was only 14 years old. Evergreen currently still occupies their barrio after years of bloodshed and loss. After the death of Scooby, Evergreen never fully recovered to the barrio they once were. I'd like to thank you guys for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe.